Eric, if you'd like to. Welcome, everybody, uh, to tonight's uh, LPLS talk. Uh, my name is Eric Blair. I'm president of LPLS, and I, I um, give you a very warm welcome to our talk tonight. Um, uh, arguably, this is one of the biggest issues that's uh, facing us as a human race, as we were just talking about beforehand, uh, along with climate change. So it's a really big issue. Uh, and it's across what we called it in LPLS, a, a cross-cutting issue that cuts across uh, science and society. And this, this is um, one of the areas that we, we, we really want to explore uh, as, a, as a society, you know, building on um, philosophy, i.e. the sciences uh, and the arts. So it's a very great pleasure uh, to welcome Gabriella here tonight to give us the, the um, philosophical, ethical and, and society uh, aspects of artificial intelligence. We heard about the, uh, the science of it a couple of weeks ago uh, from Netta Cohen and uh, uh, it's great that we can follow this up with uh, a talk on the kind of wider implications uh, of this uh, technology and, uh, for, 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 for us as a society. So um, thank you Gabriella for coming to talk to us tonight and I'm going to hand back to Rachel who's going to introduce you. Thank you Eric and yes you can find the talk from a couple of weeks back on the Leeds Villain Lit website. Um, Gabriella, welcome, um, is in her third year of postgraduate research at the University of Le Leeds and uh, while many involved in, in artificial intelligence are on the, the science or technology side using big data and hardware to create systems and refine their effectiveness in carrying out tasks, ones humans can't do, don't want to do, that can be done more cheaply or effectively with machines. So um, that's a huge side of it. But Gabriella, instead of being firmly within that area or within, even within one academic discipline, is bringing this philosophical lens to the science and technology of AI. And she's especially interested in the distinction between bias and fairness. Um, and if data, how it's specified, gathered and structured has biases within it, that has implications for how AI operates. So I'm sure we're going to hear more about that. And uh, Gabriella is not only crossing disciplines, she's also international. Her first degree is from university in Chile and she did her MSc in Edinburgh. And she's also keen to involve non-English speakers and those outside academic life in debates about the ethics of AI. So this truly is a very um, widely reaching and a wide ranging uh, approach. So thank you very much. Let's hear from you now. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm really glad uh, we get to talk about this because as Eric said, this is a huge topic. Um, Sadly, given the time and uh, the uh, how wide, basically, um, AI ethics is, we're not going to get to see all of the problems. I've just selected a few. But in any case, if you have any further questions, feel free um, so we can chat about it in the Q&A. Uh, as Rachel uh, said, I am a postgraduate researcher in my final year at the University of Leeds and I work with the Interdisciplinary Applied Ethics Center and the Institute for Data and Ethics for my thesis. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what is ethical AI and give you a landscape of all the challenges we have to think about, not only for now, the, the pressuring dilemmas we have at the moment, but also uh, a bit of a look into what could come next, given how fast the technologies are developing. First of all, I wanted to give you a little map. I think those are always helpful. And uh, roughly, I'm using a, a very traditional way of dividing AI ethics. Of course, arguably, there are other areas, you could say um, everything that has to do with transhumanism could also be put here to some extent. But I just wanted to, to give more of a general traditional way of looking into this. 
on the one hand, we have a ma machine ethics and machine ethics is mainly concerned with things about the possibility of artificial moral agents as full moral agents, meaning close to what we have uh, as humans, our capacities, um, our rationality or all whatever it is that is required for us to be full moral agents. But also it looks into what we could argue are existing artificial moral agents, which are a bit more limited. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this. Another very uh, uh, discussed issue has to do with singularity and superintelligence. I'm not gonna go deep into this sadly this time because uh, it's a huge topic, but this one has to do with the existential risk that we face as humanity uh, with the rise of AI, thinking what if we manage to develop this conscious, uh, sentient or um, rational artificial intelligence that has its own needs, its own volition, its own um, intentions. And so it could put us at risk uh, if it wanted to destroy us, for example. And it, uh, machine ethics is also related to uh, the moral status. So what kind of moral status are we giving to the machines? How are they going to be integrated into society? Um, and that obviously connects, for example, with human robot interaction. We're developing these machines, we're developing robots like we saw two weeks ago. And eventually they're getting more sophisticated and they're getting better at doing stuff that we are supposed to be the best at doing. So it's not just about creating these machines, we're also trying to integrate them into society. So what kind of moral status are we gonna give them? So if you're not familiar with this in ethics, there's been a huge uh, discussion about integrating animals into the moral sphere. So um, Peter Singer is a famous philosopher that has talked about this and he has claimed for the right of animals to be included as having a moral status that should be respected. So at some point um, it is debatable what kind of status we're going to give to these um, technologies. In continuing with human robot interaction, there are many types of robots that we are currently um, developing. S uh, sexual robots, uh, care robots, killer robots. And there's derived from this discussions about robot rights. If we are going to include them into society and they are to some extent developing certain capacities, for example, if they can feel, then should they have rights? And what type of rights? And so that's a, a whole other subfield. And obviously there is also, if we are going to conceive them rights, and if we are going to include them into society, we should also be caring about robot responsibility. What kind of um, expectations are we going to have regarding this area? And then the other two areas I've highlighted here um, have to do more with the system not so much with the hardware in, in some sort of sense, not so much with the machine, but with the system behind it. So algorithms and models are a huge um, discussion. And this has a lot of trouble uh, for different reasons. One has to do with explainability and interpretability. And this is uh, part of the discussion of explainable AI has to do with our capacity of understanding what is happening behind an algorithm. So we don't really know what it does most of the time. We do have tools that allow us to know pretty much what is happening, but especially for prediction, we don't really know what it's doing. So it's hard for us to explain it or justify what is happening and why. And so if we use it for prediction or decision-making, then that makes our job as ethicists harder because we have to justify if that was a good call or not. Connected to this, we have opacity and transparency. So it's not just transparency in terms of 
um, informing people about what kind of technology is involved. If you're using AI for healthcare, for example, what kind of machine or what kind of model is detecting um, a disease or making a prognosis um, or what kind of robot could be operating on you. Uh, there is also a level of opacity uh, connected to the systems that has to do with the level of transparency that we're able to expect or demand. And then obviously we also have epistemic and behavior manipulation that has to do with algorithmic um, inclusions into society. We are going to talk about this in just a little bit and it has to do with social media, for example, and the use of algorithms to manipulate people. Like uh, it has been done for political purposes, uh, economical purposes, and how that changes um, the fabric of society, what we trust and what we don't trust. And then data ethics, which is what I primarily work on for my thesis, um, ha uh, has to do mainly with things about how data is handled. So if you think about AI, most people don't put it almost in the same uh, subsection. It's not kind of like the same field, but I think it is to some extent because AI works with data. AI needs data to function. It, it, it's, it's the main source of power to some extent. So there are privacy and security concerns. I think these um, are very well known, uh, not only on social media and all the scandals that have been going around, but also when we were in the middle of the pandemic and um, certain technologies were trying to be introduced like um, tracing apps, then it's all about how we justify privacy. How do we justify this in security terms? And uh, to, to which point um, do we go until we say this should not be implemented? Because there are a lot of risks in data ethics related to profiling and discrimination that have to do with bias and fairness as well. It's all about how we implement data-driven technologies in such a way that we keep up certain ethical principles that we value in society. And so in order to kind of give you uh, an insight of the impact this has, we have artificial systems and we have these humans developing systems. So what AI ethics does is it goes into the normative field and ask, should we? And it's not just about asking, should we? If we say yes, we need to inform how. We need to consider risks, the type of risks, and what type of control do we have into the situation? So AI impact creates a spectrum of possibilities. With all these principles that I've mentioned, like privacy or trust or transparency and equality, it gives you um, insight into direct issues that we have. And some of them we have had as a society for ages. Historically, for example, racism is a huge problem that we have had to deal with. Um, discrimination more generally. Um, and some others are very old philosophical questions about what is dignity. So we have AI kind of connecting everything connecting most of the ethical principles that we've um, talked about in philosophy for so long, and then to somehow applies it to very particular circumstances. And I think this is one of the beauties uh, to some extent of doing AI ethics and applied ethics. And it has to do with, we're not just talking about the theory, we're not just talking about the meaning of fairness, of the meaning of trust, there comes a particular application, there comes this machine, or it could be a system that is making decisions that is being applied in the real world. And we need to figure out the meaning of that ethical principle within a particular context and figure out what to do with it. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the epistemic challenges. So we all know uh, about fake news, Deep fakes, deep fakes for those that do not know, um, alterations of images or videos that 
somehow make it seem like they're real, but they're not. So you might think that you are seeing yourself in a video, but it has been altered to make it look like you, for example. And we also have filter bubbles, which is a um, coin term by Ellie Pariser. And what uh, these filter bubbles do is kind of create this epistemic isolation, as we're going to see. So what these technologies are doing, to some extent, is changing how we know. It's not like um, before, if you, if you think about it, in terms of we have a, an exposure, overexposure, to information and misinformation. So acquiring knowledge um, and establishing a reality becomes harder. So these fake news, how they work, basically, is that sometimes they create an, appear an apparent truth. It's an appearance. So it could be uh, a mix of truth with falsehood, but there is also um, false and social satire. So it has to do with, on the one hand, something that is just, is tricking you into thinking that this could be partially true. And so the other end is basically completely false, but is um, using sarcasm or, or some sort of satire to make it uh, seem like it's real, but it's not based on any truth. What happens with this is basically we are building a pyramid for misinformation. We have a world based on links. So we prioritize content based on what sells, what is more attractive. We have a world based on likes. So we base our criteria for interactions on what looks better. So if something has more likes, we are immediate or, or more hearts, depending on the type of social media or it has more views. If you're looking for a YouTube video and you see, oh, this one ha has more views, probably it's better. And so we were tempted to create these personal epistemologies that change our discourse for cognitive interactions. So we have these social influences and we accept them as if they are part of what we have every day. So this is conflicting, especially for um, people that might not be as um, educated or familiarized with these dangers, and also with kids that are growing up with these epistemic changes in how they conceive reality. And how do these work? How do these deep fakes or filter bubbles work? On the one hand, we just have, we're um, big companies feeding us what they think or what they've decided through an algorithm to what it is that we want to see. And some people argue, well, this is great. And I've heard some people, including my dad sometimes, saying, well, I like it because it, it, it gets me. It's almost like it's providing a suggestion based on what I've seen before, or what I've liked before. So I don't have to like worry about it. I know that it's going to be uh, aligned or personalized, tailored to my taste. And that seems convenient. And that's how most people see it when they don't think about it. Um, but this is problematic, particularly when it's not just about a product. So we're not just talking about they're telling me to buy this type of sock or this TV could be better for me because it has this particular feature. We're talking about this system of filtering parts of society happens with political ideas with ethical dilemmas, with news, with how we see the world. And that's why it's conflicting. Because we somehow are put in this position in which we are forced to have particular behavior patterns. 
So we create this uh, dependency on social media and other type of technologies because it seems comfortable. So we always use the same sources of information. You follow this page, you're used to getting uh, your newsletter on the email and you're like, oh yeah, I'm getting the Washington Post or I'm, I'm getting BBC News or I'm getting whatever it is that you prefer. And then we follow, we like it, it becomes more of the same thing. And this, obviously, it's just, it creates one side of a story. Arguably, this has happened all the time because we have bubbles in terms of the type of friends we have. If we have political preferences, we tend to hang out with certain people. Um, it, before we had more of an influence on um, national TV or um, media outlets in which they are all categorized as being, for example, left wing or right wing, and we tend to prefer it. Fair enough, this has happened all the time. The problem is the exposure, the amount, and the um, consistency in which we are, to some extent, exploited by these technologies. Because if we think about it, what this creates, obviously, is ideological segregation and reduced diversity, creating this echo chamber. So it's not just about deciding what we want or what our social circle is going to be. It's being decided for us, to some extent, but we think we have decided. So we think we are empowered because we decide the like, because we decide a certain exposure. But actually how it works is that we are led to believe that that's what we want based on overexposure. So why is this conflicting from a philosophical point of view? Because it leads us to infer truth from false premises. This is a classic philosophical problem that has to do with acquiring true beliefs. And so what we need to do to kind of like contrast this situation is input normative criteria, adopt a critical stance and have more digital literacy. I think it's never enough to know how these things work and to what extent and make it easy, not put agree terms of conditions and nobody reads, make it easy, make it accessible, make it um, precise and concise. So we need to establish relations based on a principle of limited applicability. We need to frame our understanding from inquiring settings and actively seek for evidence. So this is very important. It's just, it's almost like an anti-ignorance movement. Uh, we need to keep intellectual humbleness. It's shocking how I see it as well in students when you say something and they just immediately think that because of Google it and they just had a Wikipedia entry or they just had the first link, then it's basically they have knowledge to some extent. But that's just information. It's not knowledge. And that's a key difference. We need to understand in this time and age where we have the age of information and technology and data, we need to understand that those are just the basis and the foundations to create knowledge. But knowledge requires a higher degree of um, a critical stance and a higher degree of rationalization and contrasting, which is not is obviously not um, promoted by the companies that want to keep this happening. This is one of the sides of ethical AI that has to do with how do we manage, how do we educate people to really take ownership and to some extent realize that they are the ones that are making this happen 
and they can fight back, if that makes sense. Other type of challenge that we have in um, AI ethics has to do with design. So we're creating all of these technologies, but when they first started happening, when machine learning exploded, because it's a very old, like Netta said in the previous um, session, it's a very old uh, technique, but it's just in the last few years with big data and more fancy tools, it exploded into this thing that we're creating almost everything that we like without really thinking about it. A lot of the problems that have to do with design are related to discrimination and privacy. So I'm gonna give you an example in chat box. Um, this ended up with issues about racism, sexual harassment, gender bias, and personal data. There was this open domain conversational um, chatbot created in Korea. And the users were encouraged to develop a relationship with um, this chatbot, it's a her, it's a she, uh, through regular day-to-day -day conversation. And they thought, well, we're gonna simulate a realistic 20-year-old woman because it would be more relatable. They wanted it to be uh, female because it seems more uh, approachable, they thought. And they were going to do a 20 year old, so it would appeal to most ages. But what happened? First of all, because it was an open AI, an open AI basically means that it's constantly receiving feedback and it's learning based on the interactions that it has, it has with um, the users. So the users started manipulating to some extent the type of information that the chatbot was getting. So the chatbot was learning hate speech because the interactions with the users were all about saying that sexual minorities were repulsive. Uh, they were asking it how they could make it a sex slave or um, talking about people with disabilities. Uh, people would say, oh, they give me the creeps. And so basically they're feeding all of that to the open AI. And this created this almost like a lesson to some extent to how design can not only um, change how the technology interacts with society, but also to bring the best or the worst from the users. And at the same time, not only this was happening, but also there was a, an issue with data privacy. So they failed to remove some personal information depending on context. So um, the chatbot was exposing names, locations or relationship status um, and some medical information. So we have two of the main issues that have to do with um, AI and data here. One has to do with the manipulation so that we um, see issues of fairness and discrimination replicated into the technology but also we see problems that have to do with security and privacy in not handling the data appropriately. So what this gives us is an insight into, and I love this phrase and I always use it, is that data do not speak for themselves. They need a context, they need a purpose, and that's why design can be a game changer. Because we're not just designing a technical thing. It's not enough to know if it works. It's, it's not enough to come up with the most perfect output if that output is not working or is not tailored to understand and be um, associated within society. So what are the challenges with design? It has to do with how do we think about it? This is an example from um, Caroline Criado Perez, and she's a Brazilian British um, feminist activist, and she has a wonderful book called Invisible Women. And in that book, she kind of takes us to all the data gaps we have in history. 
and how females have been, and other minorities, but primarily females, have been completely dismissed from design choices uh, historically. So one example is this restroom. We see all the time that there is always a bigger queue in the female toilet rooms. And we always say, oh, it's just, uh, they take so long, or I don't know, there's always so many of them, blah, blah, blah. And this creates an, a stereotype, right? It's like, oh, they take so long, they're slow, or I don't know what they do in there. We've, we've all heard it. But then at the same time, is, is it really that? Or is it the fact that they're not designed for what we need, biologically speaking, and socially speaking? So most of the time, when uh, women go to the toilet in pairs, it can be because the door is broken. They need someone to hold it, for example, because we all have toilets that have doors. Whereas in the case of the men's restroom, they have extra urinals that they can use. This creates a, a faster entry and exit, but also it creates um, a different setting. So this makes us question, why are we designing it this way? And it works both ways. Why is there always a changing room for babies in the women's restroom, but never in the men's? Why are, what are we missing? And this also happens with AI. So if we think about um, voice processing AI systems, uh, Female voices are less likely to be accurately processed by AI assistants because they're trained on male bias data. So they've used a lot of the data to uh, contrast or to train it. And the frequency that female voices have on average is just not as deep. So it makes it harder for the AI to assist us or to understand um, everything or to get a cue that we're talking to it. And this obviously, um, and I think this is extremely interesting because it's a perfect example of how something that seems so trivial and that is a feminist staple of how during history there's been a constant discrimination and inequality is being perme permeated into. AI. So in this book, Invisible Women, Caroline says, the excuse I came across most often in the course of writing the book was that women are just too complicated. This excuse appeared in fields ranging from economy to travel infrastructure to medicine. Women's working lives are too complicated, are complicated, our travel patterns are too complicated, our bodies are too complicated. And instead of engaging with that complexity, Researchers prefer to exclude half of the world. They choose to save money rather than to save women's lives. And I think this is critical because we are at a point in which we're creating these technologies and we should be thinking about this as the first question. We shouldn't be thinking, is this possible? Can we build it? We should be thinking, is this morally desirable? Should we build it this way? It's a conjoint preoccupation. We shouldn't be just thinking about technical feasibility, but moral desirability. And for this, it's so important to engage with complexities, to establish inclusive and ethical teams, and to design a product for real diversity. And real diversity might look different sometimes, depending on where you are or what you already have. And this is why it's so important to have there's different views from different contexts. And like Rachel said, different international perspectives, people from different experiences that can come up with niche solutions for very important problems. But for this whole design issue that we have in AI, there have been a lot of suggestions of how we can help um, managing this issue. And one of the things is having ethical and responsible design. And for this, there are a lot of principles that are considered, but basically I'm going to look into six. Flexibility. 
flexibility has to do with the aims and goals. We need to understand that if we create, for example, an AI system on an algorithm in Europe, and we intend it to be used worldwide, we need to have enough flexibility in how we put the applicability and the theoretical goals that this system is going to have because cultural differences and legal differences are going to make it different in South America or in Asia or in Africa. Principles. Principles should guide theoretical aims. And this is really important because I think one of the, and this is a personal perspective, but I think it's shared by a lot of other academics is what we've done so far in trying to integrate principles, ethical principles into these technologies is very like top bottom is about, oh, we have, you know, we've had these discussions in philosophy for so long, let's try to apply them, you know, AI should be fair. Okay, but what does that mean? What does that mean to the person that is building the AI? What does that mean to the person creating the algorithm behind it? Is so it's difficult because sometimes we forget that this is pure interdisciplinary work and we need to come up with conceptual bridges that allow us to have those discussions and understand that their side is equally important to ours and try to find a context in which it applies. And that's the next one, context. And it's informed by external theory. We're not designing robots and we shouldn't design robots or design AIs in isolation. If our intended purpose is to apply them in society, we need to understand the context, the needs, the vulnerabilities of those individuals that are going to have to interact with it because they have values. And this is the next one. Interests of stakeholders. Stakeholders, for those who are not familiarized with this, it comes from, this concept comes from um, economy and it has to do with all those that are interested because they hold values and they're going to be affected by a particular thing, in this case, the technology. And this obviously demands from us to have a normativity. We need to ask, should we, instead of just, can we? And plurality, different methods, different applications, different points of view, all coexisting together. This sounds very uh, <laughs> rainbows and hopeful thoughts, but this is doable because based on how um, the private sector and academia are working at the moment, this is what we should strive for. And it's doable. It just needs to change the narrative so that this is one of the demands that we put into the industry. So that these are the um, standards that we follow. And that also comes with what we were saying first, knowing, knowing how the technology works, knowing what it's doing to us so that we can refrain from um, participating or encouraging it so that it keeps um, having this systematic uh, discrimination or the systematic oppression to all the individuals. This is why there are a lot of um, guidelines. One of the ones I really like uh, it came out a few years ago um, at the Alan Turing Institute, and it has to do with supporting, supportive underwriting and motivating values. These are connect, protect, care, and respect. And connect has to do with sincerely, openly, and inclusively discussing. It has to do with mutual understanding, everything that I've been saying so far. Protect has to do with equal treatment and social impact, priorities of um, social values, justice, and the public interest. Care has to do with the well being of each and all, do no harm. I respect informed decisions and a respect to autonomy, the dignity of individuals and persons. And this is extremely important because for so long in ethics and in, pol in politics and sociology, we always, even in, in, in the sciences, when there was an interaction with individuals for um, testings or um, implementing new um, 
technologies, we've always thought, well, we need informed consent. Uh, we need, but there's so many other ways in which dignity can be affected that might not be so obvious and that we're going to see in a second when I talk about robots. The other type of principles that we have for design have to do with fairness, sustainability, transparency, and accountability. And like I said, I do like these approaches, but I am very critical of them as well. I think to some extent, they are good macro ethics. They tell you what kind of principles we should be following. But a lot of the work that needs to be done, and hopefully I am trying to contribute to it uh, with my work, is microethics. It's not just about the principles we should be following, it's taking one of those like fairness and establish this is how it should be understood, this is how we morally justify fairness if we're developing and designing an AI system. And that's the kind of work that we still have to keep developing, at least on the AI ethics side. The other uh, example that I wanted to talk about is human-robot interactions. Human-robot interactions is a huge thing, especially now that we're using robots for a lot of things that are related to care, healthcare, or uh, using them for um, personal, very personal um, social interactions. So these have to do, the ones I'm going to mention now, with the Uncanny Valley, for those that are not familiarized with uncanny valley, it basically means that we reach a point in which a technology or an object is so similar to a human that we are unable to distinguish if it is or not human. And so that creates a, a sense of um, being uncomfortable in, 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 a, in an eerie way. Feminism, care ethics, robot rights and responsibility. So, one of the things that we have been doing a lot with um, robots is wondering how we should treat them, how should we design them and implement them. So for this, I'm going to look a little bit about sex robots, care robots, and military robots. Sex robots has created a huge debate in the academic world, but also in the private sector because there are a lot of points of view conflicting here. Some say in favor, we should develop sex, sex robots because they can be used for therapeutic reasons. We can use them for sex offenders so they can treat their disease. Um, we can use it in dementia patients so they're not deprived from this biological need and they don't have conflicts with consent. Others think, oh, it has to do with sexual liberty. It's good that we have this because we're challenging gendered norms. This idea that there's just one way of being sexual or there's just one way of integrating this into our personal lives. But then we also have these people who think, well, sex robots should not really be pursued. One of the reasons is political. They think is exploiting the human body as a commodity. So a lot of the sex robots are not really used for therapeutic reasons. They're not being used personally. They're exploding the sex business and the porn business. So it's all about keeping up this capitalist idea that we can sell sex. Others think there are psychological reasons. We're going to develop this kind of technophobia eventually because we're going to reduce empathy. A lot of people argue that by having this type of robots included into society, accepted into society, we're going to detach ourselves emotionally from what it means to have sexual socialization with other humans. So we're going to somehow experience this uh, depravity or this um, lost sense of what it is to be human. From an ethical point of view is the objectification of women and consent issues. Um, a lot of the people that tend to interact with these robots or have them, usually have them because they have this um, obsession with manipulating women or the thinking that this can be simulated by rape 
So this brings a huge sensitive issue that has to do with um, perpetrating rape culture. And then there are also social points of view that have to do with impact and change in the social fabric of human relations, which is a bit of everything. The debate of care robots is a bit different for obvious reasons, I guess. The thing with care robots is we have three options here. We can develop care robots that are considered as tools. Um, others are considered as social tools. And others that are considered as companions. What we can sit, consider them uh, tools basically means that they do things for us, but they tend not to be um, anthropomorphized or they tend to not be uh, reflecting any type of other uh, humanistic traits. So they're just considered like a mouse or a phone or any other object. Social tools. Um, Robots as social tools has to do more with this idea that they interact with us, like a chatbot or your Alexa at home or um, Siri or on your phone. And they, they tend to look after you and you can interact with them in a, in a more of a normal way, if you want to say it like that but with very specific limitations that might not let you think that you're necessarily involved with a thinking type of robot. You can realize that they're just limited machines. And then you can develop a robot as a companion that is intended to make you feel like you have a relationship with it and is intended to care for you, but also provide that psychological um, relief as is taking care of you. And care robots are mainly being developed for people with uh, cognitive issues, uh, emotional issues, and especially for patients um, with dementia or physical limitations um, so that they can be included into their homes and they feel um, accompanied or safe in the presence of the robot. And obviously this has huge implications, including safety. So because they're designed mainly for people that could have uh, limitations to move around, then you have to design them in such a way that they're safe and it won't be a hazard for people that cannot, for example, move uh, out of the way of the robot very easily or that they cannot really pick up the robot um, because they can, they're in a wheelchair. Um, another issue has to do with deception, and this is interesting, and it can happen a lot, and it has to do with misunderstanding the capabilities of a robot. It can be very easy for us to attribute capabilities that they don't have, especially if they look human or if they look like animals. So if they look like a little pet, we're going to be tempted to treat them as if it was a pet, and a lot of people, if not most people, treat their pets as part of their family. So that can create this idea that they're able to do more and they're able to care more than they actually can. And obviously this can create frustrations, especially with patients that do have a problem understa understanding those limitations and creating this reality in which they think they have a friend or a proper companion when actually it's just a very limited machine. This also thing um, kind of puts another risk on the table that has to do with dignity. So there is a risk of patronizing and infantilizing people, especially in when they're in their third age, um, because the robot could almost like treat them as a child. So it has to be designed in such a way that you uphold the dignity and the uh, proper interactions that you should have with that person and that patient, depending on the needs that the patient has. Another type of risk has to do with isolation. So the replacement of socialization, because they become so dependent on the robot and the type of interaction they can have with it, that they forget how it is to interact with real humans. 
This was actually very challenging during the pandemic because there are a lot of people that were reliant on robots and were so used to see the robot that they felt uncomfortable and not safe telling, for example, medical issues they had to a human. So they had to do it through the robot and the medics had to get the information from their system. Another issue has to do with privacy, sacrificing privacy for the need of care. And this is an interesting one because to some extent, uh, when these technologies are just recently being developed, there are a lot, there are a lot of um, needs for knowing all the information that it's been giving. They have cameras just so they can test them out and make sure they're safe. But at the same time, there is this trade-off between sacrificing that privacy for the need of care that the robot could provide. And finally, another issue is vulnerability. So we need to keep in mind cognitive limitations, consent, manipulation, and all that has to do with um, how the patient is vulnerable to the interactions with the robot. Finally, we have military robots. And this is very straightforward. There are people against and in favor. Against military robots, um, the main two arguments could be um, summarized as cheaper war co costs. So basically, the problem that wars um, are cheaper is that it can promote more events. And on the other hand, we have killer robots. I'm sure you've all heard about this. And it has to do with um, innocent civilians getting killed because we shouldn't be given the autonomy um, and the possibility of making these type of decisions to robots that are unable to distinguish between enemy um, and friends or allies. And in favor of military robots, we have the fact that they can reduce casualties. And so because they say, well, yes, probably we shouldn't give them so much freedom, but at the same time, because they, re they don't have this PTSD that most soldiers do have and stress trigger atrocities that happen because you're in a state of shock, then we could reduce that by using robots because they wouldn't be affected emotionally and psychologically in the same way. And that just leaves us with the question that we're still debating and there is no right answer is should we delegate decision-making to robot soldiers? Of course, I do think that there's always caveats and things that we should consider. And in some cases it might be that it's better and in some cases it might not, but this is roughly the general picture. And finally, I wanna end with just commenting on the possibility of artificial moral agents. Um, MAAs are a challenge for moral philosophers and obviously for um, people developing or trying to develop these technologies. Because as of now, there is a consensus that there is no such thing as a full ethical artificial moral agent. But of course, we're wondering about the future. And this is something that is almost, um, inevitable when talking about AI. And this just does not happen to, you know, people that do not work in this area. It happens to all of us that we think, but what if, what if we manage to make it uh, reach this point? And one of the things that happens with artificial moral agents is that we currently have this idea that their AIs are no moral agents. Most philosophers would tell you, yes, they are, but they're just limited moral agents. So they can be implicit ethical agents, which means that they have internal functions that show ethical behavior. So for example, they, um, in a very basic way, an ATM, for example, can give you the right amount of money. And so upholding this idea that you're getting what you should get. Implicit. Explicit ethical agents follow ethical rules through formalization. This is a bit more complex and it has to do with um, how we encode 
certain ethical principles. So we can encode through um, consequentialism or a deontology, so rule followed or um, based on the consequence, and we try to put it into the system, and they will say, well, they have followed the rule. They're explicit ethical agents because they've been designed to perform under this particular ethical view. And then the one that everyone's wondering about is full ethical agents, and it has to do with the agent's uh, beliefs, desires, and there is a list of potential things that we think should be necessary to develop a full moral agent, but obviously there is no way of proving it yet, um, because this is these are the things that we recognize in ourselves, and because we are full moral agents, we think these are the things that should be put into the AI. So can we create more robots is one of the things that is massive in this field. But more, more importantly, once again, for me, the question is, should we create them? Why do we want them? Why would we want full ethical agents? So briefly, this is just to summarize, what is AI ethics? It's a very vast field and the challenges of AI ethics are constantly being updated. So we need to be uh, on top of our game, but also we need to always be aware that this is just constantly changing and therefore there are no real um, solid definitive answers. They, they demand interdisciplinary approaches for sure. I don't think we're at a time and place in which we can afford to just be in our offices doing our own thing. Communication is key and that's one of the things that I'm more uh, excited about is just creating these interdisciplinary dialogues because I see an opportunity to improve our critical thinking and our ethical frameworks by doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've just realized my camera is not, it, it went, it died. <laughs> But we could still hear you perfectly well, fortunately, Gabrielle. Okay. And I didn't think it was sensible to interrupt, given that, you know, the sound was perfectly good and, and we could still see your lovely image. So there we are. Um, great. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Let me just remove the pin so we can get everybody onto the screen who wants to come in. Um, uh, now, if um, you're very welcome to put um, questions or comments into the chat. Um, or to um, you know put your hand up and uh, and actually say that you would like to give ask your question or make your point in person. Um, I wonder, Eric, do you have something that you would like to kick off with? Well, I I, I just wondered if um, all of this does it does all these considerations uh, it, does it give us a, more of an idea what it is to be a human? That's an excellent point. And I, and I think that's one of the beauties uh, that I've realized studying and working on this is that it takes you to that place in which we're trying to replicate to some extent or to realize what it is to be human. And it challenges us because we realize we're not really sure. Yeah. If, you, if you think you're trying to design this thing because you want, you want it to integrate it, you want it to be more human, or value based or more human um, like, but then you realize what is it exactly the essence of being human? Is it just uh, the way our biology works? We try to imitate that with robots. We try to imitate movement from animals, but then we realize, oh, it might be that there is something else. What is it something else? Can, can we measure it? Certainly not. And so it takes us, I think, to that basis of philosophical thinking back to the Greeks <laughs> in ancient Greece. And it takes us to almost question what it is that it means to be human. And I think it's beautiful to some extent because it connects us to fundamental questions that I think at least uh, sciences in general uh, after the industrial revolution were a bit more prone to results and forgot about how science was based on all of these questions. And I think it's beautiful that we're connecting again, for sure. Mm. I mean, does all of this um, lead to dystopia? I mean, there's a, a book, a novel by Kazuo Ishiguro, um, 
came out recently called Clara and the Sun, which I, I actually found quite disturbing in a way. It was, it was quite, quite a dystopian vision of the relationship of robots and, and humans. And is it, is it destined to go wrong, do you think? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is where I have a lot of debates um, on coffee breaks with colleagues and, and professors. Um, personally, I do think that it could go wrong, mainly because of ambitions that are misplaced. And that's why my, so my main goal, I guess, as an academic, um, is creating dialogues so that we are very careful, not only in the type of thing that we want to create, but also considering what type of thing we might become if we create those. And I think um, if we think about it, the type of technologies that we're able to develop at this time and place, they're allowing us to do things that we that, that seemed like sci-fi 20 or 30 years ago. So I think that it is possible, sadly, but at the same time, I do feel kind of like a sense of moral obligation to discuss this so that we are at least, if we decide to go that way, we're doing it because we have considered all of the options and not because we were not careful and prudent enough to do otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Um, can, I, can I also ask about how robots interact with each other? I mean, do you envisage um, a, a separate and parallel society of, of, of robots? It's interesting because uh, the way I see it is if we indeed um, come up with a way that allows us to develop, for example, artificial moral agents or artificial agents that have a level of consciousness or rationality so that we consider them and they consider themselves uh, an, an entity, an autonomous entity. Um, I think I personally believe that the best way of achieving that is going to be through evolution. So replicating some sort of evolutionary sense into the machines so that they have the ability to create goals and create ambitions by themselves. Obviously, this is still a speculation, but let's say that that happens and let's say that that's possible. I think that the type of morality that we're expecting these machines are going to develop is not necessarily going to look like we think it's going to look because the basis for our desire is I, and I personally think this is, is we are subject to our passions in a very human sense. We are slaves of the passions. We are biological beings. We feel these emotions. So whatever it is that these machines are able to feel or think are going to, is going to give them a different perspective of what it is to be, to be moral is not necessarily going to be the same thing as us. So I think it's going, it would be interesting to think what kind of relationship they build amongst themselves, what kind of society they would be able to create because they are going to be uh, based on different values and different experiences. So I do think they are going to create a, a completely different um, set of um, ethical principles, for example. Mm. That's fascinating. So, um... What, uh, what, uh, what about other people? Uh, and do people have questions here? Uh, I, I'm just keeping an eye on my chat on the chat here. I don't have just, any. Uh, uh, um, people not being able. Uh, one of our um, yes. attendees can't um, seem to activate the gallery yeah. view or to put um, a video back on again. I hope that um, yes. you can. I mean, I think I think you're allowed to put your video back on now. Um, it, it, uh, Peter Reynolds, uh, well, I can certainly see you in gallery now, Peter, if that's helpful yeah, for there you. There we are, yeah. I think, think you've got it. Uh, I can ask you to, and un un I think I have to ask you to unmute. If you want to, uh, yeah. I can, I have to go through and do that now. But, okay. but, but, but did you want to ask a question, Peter? We can hear you, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm struggling to. to um... 
Well, we can see you, and uh, and on the top right, it, it says view, and you can choose gallery. Yeah, view. I, I think my mute is, is now unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. View is right, yeah. yeah, we can hear you. I can't get gallery view anywhere, but never mind. Never mind. Uh, it's just flicking between, I can see myself in the top right hand corner, but at, uh, and you are at your full screen, mm. but there's no option to gallery view at all. Anyway, not to worry, I don't let me know all things up. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've nothing other than that was a fascinating talk. Um, thank you very much, Gabriella. Uh, this is uh, the, oh, the other way. Yeah, that, that's the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Elizabeth, I think, ha wants to say something. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, thank you very much for a, a really fascinating talk, kept, kept me wrapped. And so much of this is so completely new to me. It wasn't completely above my head, I don't think. Um, when you started at the beginning about, I couldn't believe that all these people, because, you know, actually, because I don't use it, it seems so strange to me that they actually take any notice about how many likes or something people have had. Now, I make quite sure that nobody tracks me, never. <laughs> and I have a, you know, I use DuckDuckGo as my, whatever you call it, web thing that keeps no track of what I've been yep. doing whatsoever. But, the, but my question really is, you, you finish by saying, you know, should we create moral robots? Quite right. But what are they for anyway? What would anybody want one for? What, what, what would they do? You've, you've talked about the, you know, the different categories. Are you saying that those different categories might become moral robots to do that work? Or that, you know, separately we'll have robots who can um decide moral issues it lost me a bit there please yeah so right. uh thank you for your question uh I th so the possibility the, the the examples i gave are basically things that already exist we have yeah. military robots we have care robots yeah. we have uh, all of that now the pursuit of the development of artificial moral agents could be applicable to those and is in itself a different thing so it's is something that and this i always question myself the exact same thing that you're saying why would you want one of those some people think well if we are faced in, with a moral dilemma for example or if we are going to apply care robots to uh, take care of patients and they find themselves in a situation they have not been programmed to do or there is just completely novel to them. Some people think, well, it might be better to have this type of agency included into the robot so that it's able to actually make these decisions by itself. And okay, I kind of get it, but I still think that if that's what you want to do, you should still have like a level of um limitation i still think it's possible to apply that in such a way that you don't make it a completely autonomous being. Yes. that pursuit of that idea that we can create ais that are able to think by themselves i think has been driven by the naive uh kind of hopes and dreams that came with like 60s and 70s sci-fi um, and this whole idea that we should be able to create something like that but I just keep questioning myself if you're not able to provide me enough justification of why we should need this or what we should actually benefit from this then the, the mere capability of doing it doesn't seem to be enough to me yeah absolutely so following on from that, Gabriella, um, how would you then perhaps build in a threshold beyond which a, a robot would have to stop trying to make decisions and actually refer to a panel of either real people or a, or a mixture of people and robots before- that, That's interesting things. because that takes us to the whole robot rights thing. So because people are already thinking about, hey, we're trying to develop this, 
it might be that they if they achieve even however limited level of consciousness or level of autonomy it might be that they feel overridden by our limitations so it's what kind of rights should we give them if we give them the power to be autonomous and that creates a whole other problem it's just like a a, a, a complete rabbit hole that you just keep going into and and i think it's fascinating that we as humans having the possibility to use the technologies to solve the well-being and the injustices we currently have in society, we somehow seem fascinated with the idea of creating a whole other society that we don't know how it's going to go about for us, which I, I completely don't us. I, I probably like, it's really funny because a lot of people my age are like, but why wouldn't you want to? And I'm like, because I would rather solve a lot of the problems we currently have like climate change and inequality but well if you we, i don't know it just it, it gets me going because i think we have a chance to use the technology to really do some change mm. and i just see ourselves getting into the same type of mistakes we've done before with nuclear bob bombs or this kind of like scientific achievements that we want to prove ourselves but yeah. at the same time we're destroying ourselves I, th I think that's right, and it also connects to the to the point you made about um, microethics, how the the principles uh, that's not enough to list the principles. They have to be properly integrated into the way you design the robots and what they how they go about doing what they do. Um, and isn't there always going to be the temptation? I'm sorry if the sound is peculiar, it is to me, but anyway, I hope there's not feedback for others. Um, there's always the temptation for people to try to use tools for power and money. Rachel, sorry, yeah. I, think it's some, I think it's Ma who's yeah. not muted and it, it's right, cutting okay. through, so that's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I was, um, I was wondering if it was, but I didn't want to be too... Um, like a robot deliberately um, cutting somebody off. Um, uh, right. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that whole um, conundrum of, you know, the, the, the very clever people who might never even actually have heard the word epistemology or have read any ethics and are motivated more by greed and power um, of probably, you know, as in so much else, well, why are we in the mess we're in, going to get the upper hand in this field as well. Yeah, I think that's one of my main criticisms and that's why, um, like you mentioned at the beginning, I'm interested in trying to um, create instances in which we can talk about these things and uh, make it um, accessible for the wider public and from people from different, um, for, for Spanish speakers particularly, because a lot of the, the debates that we're having obviously are Anglo-centric and that leaves, what, <laughs> more than half percent of the world. Uh, once again, we are creating a gap. And I think as young academics, we do have this, or at least I do have this sense of, um, I have to do something about it. I have to at least do my best so, so that this doesn't happen. I know I'm, I'm basically trying to go into a massive wall with these companies and everything, but I think that um, it's just, it's the best we can do really, because if, if you think about it the other day when WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram basically collapsed, everyone was having a, almost like an existential crisis and everyone realized two things at least, um, one, where you're all depending on a conglomerate that basically is dominating how you interact with all the people you care and do not care about. And the other thing is basically um, you have choices, which I, I think people are not so easy to uh, really be eager to realize that the real choices are not in the interaction with what the status quo the real choices are thinking for yourself and realizing is this really what i want or not and i think moving towards that direction is is what we can hope for i, I think janet has a question 
Yes, um, thank you very much. I find that fascinating. Um, but like Elizabeth, there were times when I thought, hang on, you know, can I follow this? But really, um, one of the areas you did mention the word um, at one point, which I would um, myself see almost as ownership of data. Um, and I can recall, although the most famous one, I suppose, is um, the reproduction of songs and things like this. I do recall when Google Books first attempted to launch itself and approached the major research libraries in America and um, indeed the UK with the offer to digitize their complete holdings and make them available on the net. And of course, this was Google. I think it started as idealistic, but it then became commercial. And in fact, they hadn't thought about copyright, the rights of authors to receive a remuneration for their works. And I think we thank the French and the Germans who um, with the um, very complex copyright structures are having sorted that out. So does, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not talking about physical robots, but I do wonder, copyright is, is limping massively behind and what, who owns the copyright in data sets is one of the issues which still isn't founded. So is this an underlying sort of principle somewhere in your tremendous mapping of the dangers? Because I do see that, that idealism, just because we have all the internet or all the artificial intelligence, which enables us to do so many things we couldn't do before, but who owns data? I mean, thank you, thank you so much for this. And it, you're spot on. I think one of the biggest problems that we have with this is that we have um, massive companies owning data sets that then become this kind of currency that they can use for power dynamics in society. Just think about it, how it affects the development of all the important type of technology. So let's say that you want to develop um, a kind of uh, watch or a tracker for any cardiac events that you could have. So you can wear it and it's like this new te technology you're testing. And you're going to have to get data sets in order to test based on um, any kind of cardiac information for different people. So on the one hand, you're going to have to be, OK, do I gather it myself if you're in an institution that doesn't have access and has not pay that um, wall? then you're gonna have to be like, okay, this is owned by the big companies. I'm gonna have to somehow fund this because I cannot acquire it myself because I don't have the resources. Then you have to go to them. And then they're gonna be like, okay, but in order to get this data, you have to follow this protocol and we have to be acknowledged as part of, and that already creates, you know, there are the intentions behind this. We're not really trying to make it open in such a way that, we allow technologies to develop, but we're putting further um, walls to make them happen. So we have two issues here, I see. One would be that one, which is basically putting political or economical reasons above the actual development of scientific progress, which I think is just a problem that we have had for years, but that now is just increased based on the dynamics of these new technologies. And the other problem has to do with copyright and who owns the data. So there is a huge um, a debate that has to do with individuals, like Elizabeth was saying, sort of like, I don't want anything tracked. I don't want to give my data to all these people because they're going to use it for their own benefit. 
So this is this whole movement that combines legality. So how do we make it so that data privacy and data um, sets are protected uh, in such a way that not everyone can access them? But then at the same time, we should be, there are types of data sets or there are type of information that probably we should make available for certain purposes. So it's all about trying to find in which context and who is affected. And that relates to, like you said, one of the principles that I talked about that is um, um, vulnerabilities. So it's about what existing vulnerabilities would allow us to morally justify that this type of data should be used in a certain way or should be protected in a certain way. So yeah, definitely is connected to the principles I mentioned. Okay, folks, I think uh, uh, we've had a, a pretty good go at this. And uh, thank you very much, Gabriella, for answering these questions so thoroughly. Great. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And if at any point you, you want to send me any questions, Rachel has my email. I'm very open. I'm always happy to receive any questions. So if you've read the news and you're wondering, is this really the case? Is this actually what's happening with AI? I'll be happy to get in touch. And uh, yes, thank you so much. I'm sure that there will be uh, people from the Leeds Phil and Lit who'd be very pleased to be involved in any sort of a forum that you might want to convene or recruit other people, you know, into a, into a forum beyond academia, you know, to, to debate further on, on these matters. It's all absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel in, in a moment just to give us an update on uh, our next uh, talks. Um, uh, if you are a visitor, um, I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the LPLS talk. Uh, do have a look at our website, uh, leadsphilandlit.org.uk, uh, where you, you'll see much more about us and what we're, what we're doing. Um, you might even like to, to, to join the society. Um, it's uh, very modest. Uh, if you're 18 to 25, it's free. Uh, or you, you might even like to, to leave us a don donation. It's all possible on the website. So uh, uh, thank you again for uh, everybody for attending tonight. Uh, I'll hand over to Rachel to close the meeting and uh, uh, to tell us what, what, what we're doing next. Yes, I'm just going to try to um, share this uh, slide with you to um, say that we've got uh, the um, annual Priestley Lecture coming up. We're very pleased to be able to say that we've got Professor Kath Noakes, our very own Professor Kath Noakes, um, who's um, a mechanical engineer in our own university, one of our universities, and um, she's going to be speaking on this very interesting topic. And it'll be a hybrid event that people are booking already uh, from within the society and our mailing list. And I'm going to be opening it up to others and the places are going fast. So if you want to be there or to be online, do make sure that you book soon. And uh, if you think other people will be interested, uh, get them to book quickly. Um, so uh, Eric and I are going to be discussing the logistics of all, all that. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, there is another talk coming up in, um, in November as well. Uh, Professor Nick Tosca from Cambridge University on the Mars mission, which will be a very interesting one, I think. Um, and I just, uh, I suspect that there's some more comments in the chat here. Um, yeah, so people saying thank you very much um, for, the, for the talk. So I shall um, stop sharing my screen and I shall stop the recording now.